Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı. Ne fazla ne az. Can't have feelings that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why you think our country so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone sticks me on. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Welcome to Varnbog. And today we're here with Dr. Gene Bajelon. And we're going to talk about the situation of the Kurds for the last, I don't know, 150 years. Um, so, how did the Kurdish situation begin in our current political context? Like, what began at the end of the Ottoman Empire that led to the Kurdish being spread over several, at least three, if not four or five different states and having tensions in all those states. Well, it's great to be here, Varn. Good to see you. And you, I see you're coming in hot with the, uh, the, the big questions. And that's a very reasonable question. So if we want to sort of look at the modern iteration of the Kurdish question, we need to look at the First World War and the fallout of the First World War. And in a very brief sense, the outcome of the war was the partition of the Ottoman Empire on one hand, which led to the formations of nation states, the Republic of Turkey, but also Iraq and Syria, which were colonies of Great Britain and France, respectively. But were governed as mandates, that is, uh, pseudo-nation states. So they were established as nation states under European guidance. In addition to that, during this period, we also see the resurgence of central government authority in Iran and the establishment of the Pahlavi dynasty and a more vigorous centralized state in Iran. So prior to this period, uh, the majority of the Kurds had lived in the Ottoman Empire, and then there was a significant minority that lived in Iran. The Kurdish homeland, Kurdistan, was basically divided between these two empires. But in saying that, you know, when we think of this division prior to the end of the First World War, it was not a very hard partition. The frontiers were poorly established. You know, the, during the 19th century, there was a process of boundary creation but you know they only finalized the ottoman iranian boundary in 1914 uh, and during the war that that border was entirely ignored so there was uh, it was a very porous border prior to the uh, uh, first world war and after the first world war we have this new system of nation states in the middle east the turkish nation state a persian nation state so the 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 Iranian empire sort of transformed from an imperial state under the Qajars to a, to a more vigorous nation state under the Pahlavis. And then, of course, you know, you have Iraq, Syria as Arab nation states. And the Kurds were basically excluded from this. And the Kurds found themselves living no longer in imperial states that defined themselves and legitimized themselves uh, with primarily through Islam and loyalty to a particular dynasty, uh, but rather within nation states that were being defined increasingly in ethno-national terms. And the Kurds, in a sense, did not fit within any of these national project projects. And so, you know, in these various countries were subject to 
repression, cultural repression, political repression, um, and uh, you know the the response for that in in over the last century has been the growth of Kurdish militancy, sometimes in the form of separatist nationalism, but also in the form of Kurdish participation in other political movements, such as the communist movement in Iraq, for example. Um, the Kurds played a critical role in the formation of the Iraqi Communist Party. In Turkey, Kurds played a critical role in left-wing politics. And of course, there were also elements of Kurdish societies that uh, found a modus vivendi with the ruling elites in these various countries as well. So, you know, in Turkey, the Turkish state was put in particular after the introduction of multi-party politics in the 1950s, uh, often had good relations, for example, with Kurdish tribal leaders. You know, in Iraq, landowners uh, were close with the monarchy. Uh, in Iran, you had similar dynamics taking place. So basically the modern iteration of the Kurdish question is a product of the way that the imperial systems that had dominated the Middle East prior to the First World War came to an end. And this new system of nation states came into existence, a system which the Kurds, as a national group or a group that aspired, that saw itself uh, as a nation, was excluded from because there was no. Kurdish nation state created at the end of the First World War. Why had Kurdish um, peoples under the Ottoman rule been able to resist either Arabization or Persianization or any of the other cultural um, hegemonic uh, kind of baggage that came with the Islamicate world? Sure. So if we look, I mean, we can go, we can go back as far as you, you would like in this uh, sort of story, but sort of in a general sense, if we look at the, let's say, ethnogenesis of the Kurds, the, it's, it's a very murky process. You know, it's a very, it's hard to ascertain exactly you know, when the Kurds came into existence as a group, were early um, sort of exam, were early references to Kurds referring to a group that saw itself as a group, or was it just a designation given by outsiders? It's very hard to ascertain. But uh, if we look at the earliest sort of references to the Kurds, we see it in the early Islamic period. And the Kurds are, in early Islamic sources, described as one of the people groups that resisted the Arab conquests, uh, just like you know Persians and other groups, like uh, other groups that fought against the Islamic conquest. But because Kurds inhabited a relatively mountainous district, uh, you know the 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 touch of imperial rule was relatively light the technological infrastructure that's necessary to implement sort of cultural and political hegemony over particularly groups that inhabit mountains did not really exist. Right down to the 20th century, it was really air power that proved critical in the subjugation of, uh, of the Kurds and the implementations of policies directed at assimilating with them. And of course, in the pre-nationalist, pre-modern era, there isn't really necessarily a political impulse to impose cultural uniformity on a group such as the Kurds as well. So we have, you know, the Kurds uh, uh, as a people group, as a distinct group, sort of maintained or and even developed a sense of identity, a sense of identity which I would note, of course, did not apply to every single person who we might call a Kurd today, or every single speaker of a Kurdish dialect. But, um, you know, there was a sense 
even before the 19th century, at least among some elements of Kurdish society, that there was a distinctive community of Kurds. And of course, in this pre-nationalist era, it's a kind of fuzzy identity. For example, you might have Kurdish tribes that claimed descent from, you know, uh, the prophet or from uh, Arab tribes way back. You might have Turkish tribes that, you know, claimed they had original, you know, had originally been uh, Kurdish, Kurdish tribes. For example, the Safavid dynasty, which took over uh, Iran in the 16th century, was culturally speaking, a predominantly Turkish group, but the origins were with a Kurdish uh, founder. So these, these, these group identities were very porous and, and were not, uh, you know, there was not a hard line between these various identities. So, you know, the, the distinction between Kurds, Arabs, Persians, you know, was often contextual and very different from the way we might see national differences today. In addition, the Kurdish identity also possessed a socioeconomic function. So, uh, for example, within Kurdish society, tribal groups, tribally organized groups, often would not regard, for example, sedentary peasants who spoke a dialect of Kurdish as being Kurdish. They would see themselves as a distinct group. Uh, one of the sources that I've looked at in my research, for example, noted that um, you know Kurdish tribal leaders would get very angry when outsiders would call, you know, peasants Kurds because they spoke Kurdish. The tribes, the tribal leaders would say, "No, th this is nonsense. These people are, you know, these people are the flock. These people are below us. These aren't part of the same race." So there was an almost sort of uh, racialization, ethnicization of class differences between it, within Kurdish society as well. So before the 19th century, there is a sort of sense of Kurdish identity, which plays, you know, different roles in different political contexts, uh, which, you know, at times is, you know, not very defined, but at other times can become an axis of political activity. A good example of this would be uh, the rise to power of Saladin Ayyubi. Uh, Saladin Ayyubi was uh, part of an expeditionary force dispatched to Egypt during the Crusades. The, uh, the people dispatching him were the Zenganids, who were a Turkic dynasty. The Zenganids had integrated Kurdish tribes into their military forces. And uh, Saladin's uncle, Shekho, was appointed the commander of the expeditionary force that intervened into Fatimid Egypt to forestall a crusader invasion of Egypt. Now, when Shekho died, there was a power struggle within that army, and you know the the the, the lines of the conflict within the Zenganid army broke down along ethnic lines, with the Kurdish tribal groups backing. Uh, uh, Saladin's rise to power. But of course, that didn't stop later on, you know, Turks and Kurds cooperating in the conflict uh, against the Crusaders. Although at times there would be ethnic tensions within uh, the, the Ayyubid military between Turkic elements and, and Kurdish elements. So, you know, you have ethnic identity sometimes playing a role in, um, uh, in political activity, but in a very different way from the way ethnicity is mobilized today within the broader discourse of nationality, if that makes sense to you. It does. So one question that immediately comes to mind is why were the Kurds excluded from the nation state process after the fall of the Ottoman Empire after World War I? Well, I actually have a very simple answer to this, which is somewhat controversial within my field. And I just argue it was kind of an accident of the First World War, the way that the First World War sort of shook out, right? The outcomes of that conflict. Um, and basically, although the Ottoman, uh, although the First World War led to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the particular geo political and military constellation that existed at the end of the war 
was not particularly favorable to the creation of a Kurdish state. Why was that? Well, um, the British during the war successfully occupied Syria and Iraq, and eventually the southern portion of uh, Kurdistan, the, the Kurdish districts that are attached to the province of Mosul, which is the was the northernmost province, Ottoman province that was included into Iraq. However, the, the, the power prior to the First World War that had the most direct interest in Kurdish affairs had been Tsarist Russia. In fact, prior to the First World War, there were a number of Kurdish political leaders uh, who were cooperating with the Tsarist authorities in order to subvert um, Ottoman rule across Eastern Anatolia. The Russian bureaucracy, particularly the Russian bureaucracy, not in not in St. Petersburg, but in uh, in the Caucasus, was actually very skeptical of Armenian nationalism. They were concerned that you know Armenian nationalism can come back and bite them because, of course, the 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 Russians ruled over significant portions of historical Armenia. So many officials within the imperial bureaucracy in the Caucasus Mountains advocated a more pro-Kurdish policy because that was a safer option for them. And there was an individual known as uh, Abdurazek Bedrkhan, who basically kind of tried to get Russian patronage to support him uh, raising a rebellion in the years leading up to the First World War in, 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 in the Kurdish inhabited regions of the Ottoman Empire. And when the war broke out and the Russians occupied large parts of eastern Anatolia, Abdurazak Begahan was appointed as a governor by the Russians. He was appointed the governor of Ezrum. One of his relatives was appointed to another important position. However, of course, there was a very important event that happened in uh, November 1917, which radically changed the geopolitical circumstances in uh, Eastern Anatolia. The collapse of Tsarist Russia led to the withdrawal of Russian forces from uh, Eastern Anatolia. And in fact, Ottoman forces not only reoccupied Eastern Anatolia, but got as far as Baku in Azerbaijan. So we have this situation in 1918, when the Ottomans eventually set, uh, uh, surrender, in which the northern districts of Kurdistan, of, of, of what Kurds claimed as their uh, ancestral homeland, were still under Ottoman rule. And some of the southern districts were still uh, under uh, were under British rule. The British basically violated the ceasefire at the end of the war and occupied Mosul uh, for a variety of different reasons. You know, the oil is perhaps one reason. Another reason was sort of geostrategic um, factors pertaining to like protecting Baghdad and Basra. But basically, Kurdistan in 1918 had de facto been partitioned. So, so uh, there was a peace process that took place, and Kurdish uh, leaders lobbied the Allied powers for a for a Kurdish state. And in fact, the 1920 Treaty of Serfs outlined a pathway to Kurdish state statehood. It sort of set uh, a number of parameters. It said, okay, Kurds can have autonomy within the Ottoman Empire. And then within a year, they could, there can be a plebiscite and we can decide you know, whether they become independent or not. But that treaty was dead on arrival because it didn't reflect the geopolitical realities on the, on the ground. The Ottoman military remained in control of uh, most of Kurdistan. The British military re remained in control of the southern parts. And very quickly, it became apparent that you know, there was the British were not interested in marching their army further north to impose a Kurdish state. And the nationalists who resisted the Treaty of Serfs basically were able to win a lot of Kurdish support. In fact, one of the reasons they were able to do this was uh, another stipulation of the Treaty of Serfs was large parts of eastern Anatolia would be assigned to an Armenian state. Many of these districts included large numbers of Kurds. So the Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who sort of led this resistance to the Treaty of Serbs and to the plans that the Europeans had to partition Anatolia, uh, 
uh, was able to propagate to Kurdish leaders that you know this army, this uh, you know this talk of a Kurdish state is really a stalking horse for the Armenians coming over and taking your land. So we have uh, we have the the remnants of the Ottoman state basically maintaining control of the northern part of Kurdistan, and in the south, very quickly the British lost interest in uh, sort of any scheme to create a Kurdish state and were more interested in attaching Mosul to their newly founded state of Iraq. One of the reasons for this was sort of the sectarian balance in Iraq. Uh, the British had very negative opinions of Shia Islam, and they wanted to have a, they wanted to impose Faisal, a Sunni leader on Iraq. And so by including the predominantly Sunni Kurds into the, uh, into the new state of Iraq, uh, they were sh shifted the balance of sectarian forces in Iraq a little bit more in favor of Sunnis as well. So you had uh, you had you know Britain uh, not really having an interest in establishing a Kurdish state either. So by 1923, you know the kind of dreams that Kurdish nationalists had of establishing a Kurdish state had kind of fallen by the wayside. And you know in addition to this. The Europeans never promised, for example, the Kurds of Iran any state, any statehood either. Iran had been neutral during the war, so there was not much interest in trying to carve out a big Kurdish state that would, you know, not only encompass Ottoman territory but also encompass uh, Iranian territory as well. So, basically, there was you know, the First World War was kind of a political disaster for the for Kurdish nationalists because it really set up a geopolitical and military situation that was extremely unfavorable to the establishment of the Kurdish state. For a counterfactual, you know, for example, had the Russians remained in the war, perhaps, you know, you would have had a Kurdish state under a Russian mandate, but there just wasn't a foreign power that was willing to take on the mandate of a Kurdish state. There wasn't even a foreign power that was interested in taking on the mandate of an Armenian state, which the Europeans had been so there had been a lot of um, propagation for in Europe. So geopolitics is the main reason the Kurds kind of got locked out. Although the First World War in some ways looks like this golden opportunity for Kurdish statehood, the actual specifics of the way the war uh, broke down uh, gravitated against Kurdish statehood, even for the Ottoman Kurds. Okay. Um, one question that's coming up here in the chat was, what was the Kurdish role in the Armenian genocide? Um, obviously, it's a complicated situation, and Kurds probably collaborated with both sides, but it seems to be a propaganda point in many people's uh, hat, so to speak. Well, it's a it's a very important dynamic to understand, and to understand it, we really sort of have to go back to the nineteenth century. So, prior to the nineteenth century, the legal uh, and social order of the Ottoman Empire had be been based on Islamic supremacy. Uh, I don't mean that in a kind of trite way. I mean, you know, you had a political order that was justified based on you know, a state. That's raison d'etre was the protection of Islam, and that was based on sort of the enforcement of the Muslims as the dominant group. And the Kurds as Muslims were a dominant group. And part of the way this functioned, obviously, was, you know, Christian groups such as the Armenians were, legally speaking, you know, uh, distinct and subordinate groups. In practice, obviously, you know, things were a little bit more complicated. For example, you know, non-Muslims weren't supposed to be armed, but, you know, there were examples of Armenians being armed or sometimes even fighting on the side of the Ottomans against the Iranians. But in general, we didn't have a notion of legal equality in, in the Ottoman Empire. Now, in the 19th century, we have two very important dynamics that sort of lay the foundation for conflict between Kurds and Armenians. The first is the legal emancipation of non-Muslims. Over the course of the 19th century, one of the central themes of the Ottoman reform movement was the implementation of legal equality for Muslims and non-Muslims. So, you know, th this was obviously a big contradiction with sort of within Ottoman uh, 
political ideology, but over the course of the 19th century, gradually uh, the Ottomans implement a concept of citizenship, uh, a kind of pseudo-national identity, Ottomanism, that basically states, you know, all Ottoman subjects, whatever their religion, have the same equal rights, blah, blah, blah. This is codified in the Ottoman constitution, which although recognizing Islam as the official uh, religion of the country, promises equal rights to all members of society, regardless of their religious affiliation. So obviously, for many Kurds, this was seen as a kind of betrayal of the traditional dominance of Islam. And we see you know, some of the earliest manifestations of Kurdish separatism are in part provoked by you know, a kind of distrust of the uh, uh, Ottoman government and its sort of progressive policies of trying to create legal equality for Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, non at the same time as you have this process of legal emancipation, you also have the Ottoman Empire's into integration into the global capitalist system, which also has sort of you know deep impacts on all sections of Ottoman society, and you know some Armenians become very wealthy as operating as intermediaries between uh, Western powers uh, and you know Western. Uh, capitalism and the Ottoman Empire. And so, you know, the Armenians, including sort of Armenian peasants, come to be seen as a kind of uh, fifth column by uh, the elements within the state. And within sort of the Kurdish-Armenian mixed regions, we see, uh, you know, Kurdish tribal leaders, you know, increasingly kind of expropriating Armenian land, attacking Armenians within the context of a political situation where you have the Ottomans conflicts with the capitalist powers of Europe being framed in the minds of your average Kurdish tribespersons, not as a conflict between you know, Western imperialism and the Ottoman Empire, but between Muslims and Christians, right? And in the late 19th century, the reactionary Sultan, Sultan Abdul Hamid, basically, he doesn't reverse the legal emancipation, but he basically turns a blind eye to the activities of Kurdish tribesmen and tries to harmonize the influ uh, uh, the tries to harmonize the interests of the state with Kurdish tribesmen by basically giving them card blanche to you know, steal Armenian land to, to, to tax Armenian peasants in an extra legal fashion, right? But basically allows them to run uh, rampant. He doesn't necessarily provoke the violence uh, directly, but it, it kind of turns a blind eye to it. So you have this sort of escalating conflict, which is basically in the late 19th century becomes a land conflict in which Kurdish tribal leaders are... Uh, expropriating land from Armenian peasants. Uh, at the same time as this happening, we're also seeing the implementation of a land code, which means that people start getting land deeds. So, you know, what do Kurdish tribes people do? You know, where you've had a situation where, you know, peasant Armenian peasants, for example, have had use rights over land. Suddenly, you know, when it comes when the when the government comes to register the land, you know, the Kurdish tribesman comes down points a gun at the Armenians and says, uh, this land is my land and you are now my tenants, right? So you have this sort of land uh, uh, conflict taking place. And the intensity of this conflict gets more and more, especially in the early 20th century, because the, uh, the Ottoman state increasingly becomes hostile to non-Muslim communities as a result of the conflicts in the Balkans, for example. You're having enormous population exchanges taking place. Muslims are being ethnically cleansed from the Balkans. Uh, and so uh, the Armenians basically come to be seen as a potential, another potential, you know, Christian state to be established on Muslim land. So you have these, the economic interests of Kurdish tribal leaders, plus the state's increasing hostility to Armenians uh, and the state increasingly viewing Armenians as a, a potential fifth 
column culminating in the Armenian genocide in which many Kurds take part. But we can really tell the sort of economic, we, we can see the economic roots on this because for example, in places where there was not that many Armenians, Kurds didn't necessarily uh, go out and murder Armenians, right? So in the Southern districts of Kurdistan where the Armenian population is small, you know, there weren't large scale massacres. However, in those districts along the Russian empire, as border, we do see large scale massacres and we see we see uh, tribal groups being involved in those massacres. We see urban bourgeois groups uh, being involved in those massacres. Uh, we, you know, so for example, in a place like Diyarbakir, uh, which is one of the larger urban centers in the region, the local Muslim tradesmen basically use the opportunity to steal Armenian goods and property and, uh, it, you know, take it for themselves with the acquiescence and the connivance of the Ottoman central government. So it's so there's, there's like a very strong material, materialist sort of reason for this genocide. And many Kurds participated in these ma uh, in these massacres. Hmm. Um, a couple of questions that come to mind is um, how much was this ideologically or more specifically rhetorically attached to previous notions of jihad crusade mm -hmm. um and then the other question that emerges in my mind is how much is related to a kind of co um co like a co-substantiation of, of ethnic identity um, between both Armenians and Kurds where there have been a thinner um, identity prior. Hmm. So the, in terms of the identity, obviously Kurdish and Armenian nationalism sort of, fed off each other to a, certain, uh, to a certain degree. When we look at the story of nationalism, we often look at it in terms of the relationship between a state and community, right? Mm -hmm. But in a multinational empire like the Ottoman Empire, it, there's, more com there's more complex dynamics at play, whereas you have two inverted commas subject groups conflicting with each other uh, and the state having a kind of ambiguous role. Uh, for example, after the 1908 constitutional revolution, the initial posture of the Ottoman government had been to try and clamp down on the Kurds who had been given free hand under Abdul Hamid and try and resolve the what they called the agrarian question, the question of Kurdish and Armenian lands and things like that. But by 1912, especially in the light of the Balkan Wars, and particularly after 1913, with the rise of Enver Pasha uh, following the Baba Ali uh, coup, um, and the right, you know, the rise of a kind of more Turkic, Turkist sort of uh, wing of the Young Turk movement, the, uh, the the posture was increasingly sort of hostile to Armenians and sort of a little bit more favorable to Kurds, but still, you know, not entirely. Uh, you know, not entirely coming down on one side or the other until really the outbreak of the First World War. But of course, a lot of this was framed within religious terminology. Mm -hmm. Now, what's important to understand is the, the stance of the architects of the Armenian genocide, Talat Pasha, Dr. Nazim, these people who were part of the Young Turk movement, you know, their hostility to the Armenians had a secular origin. You know, Dr. Nazim, for example, who is a lesser known figure, but was a, an important architect of the um, uh, Armenian genocide, saw the Armenians as a cancer, as untrustworthy and raci almost racialized them. You know, like uh, traditionally, Armenians could escape persecution if they converted to Islam. But during the Armenian genocide, even conversion was not good enough. So in the Armenian massacres of the uh, 1890s, 
conversion could save you know your village right 1915 rolls around conversion's not going to save your, your village so the, the 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 figures in the center of the ottoman state were influenced by sort of positivism influenced by social darwinism and these ideologies so you know there was a kind of secular hostility to the armenians in nationalistic terms but of course the propaganda of the ottoman state towards kurdish tribesmen was very much uh, executed in uh, the vocabulary of jihad of religious conflict and you know the associate the associated sort of ideological pa paraphernalia okay so this kind of leads us to the Kurdish situation now. Mm -hmm. So there are two basic questions I think need to be kind of given a broad overview. What are the sub-ethnic divisions amongst Kurds today? And what are the basic political orientations popular amongst Kurdish individuals that are not really understood by reporters in the West, leftists who accuse the Kurds of being CIA agents, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth? That is a good question. So, and it's a, it's one that is very complicated to answer. So just like every other sort of community or people group, you know, prior to the 19th century, there's no consolidated Kurdish identity. There are, you know, Kur groups described as Kurds speak multiple dialects, different, and in fact, different languages. Uh, in fact, I would go so far as, you know, the, the dialects spoken by Kurds were defined as being Kurdish because they were spoken by Kurds the dialect did not define groups as being Kurdish, if, if that makes sense, if that makes sense to you. So there's a multiplicity of different languages spoken amongst the Kurds. I like to call them varieties of Kurdish because, you know, which Kurdish is the true Kurdish is kind of a pointless argument. Uh, the um, so like Jews before the reinvention of Hebrew. Hebrew, yeah. So there's a variety. I mean, like Yiddish is a, is, is a proper Jewish language. You know, yeah, as uh, is Ladino, as, as is, is Judeo-Arabic. Exactly. So there are multiple different types of Kurdish spoken in different regions. Um, and, you know, because of the political order that prevailed in Kurdistan, uh, where you had prior to the 19th century, Ottoman rule was exercised over large parts of Kurdistan through uh, indigenous Kurdish aristocrats you know, different aristocrats patronize different dialects of Kurdish, right? So in what is Iraqi Kurdistan today, the Baban dynasty patronized the Sorani dialect of Kurdish, which used to be called Babani because it was so associated with the Baban dynasty. The Erdogan dynasty in Iran uh, patronized the Goran di uh, Gorani dialect of Kurdish. Uh, religious schools in the northern regions of Kurdistan used Kirmanji dialects, right? All of these, you know, there were there were multiple, multiple uh, dialects spoken and also multiple literary dialects as well. Um, and then of course you have sectarian differences amongst the Kurds. You know, there were, there are, there are of course the majority of Kurds are Sunni Muslim. Most of them are followers of the Shafi'i uh, school of uh, Islamic jurisprudence, but this is not universal. Some Sunni Kurds were Hanafis, uh, especially those that lived close to, you know, predominantly Turkish regions. Uh, there were also Alevis, who were their own particular sect of um, Islam, that we might say, they're kind of uh, pro-Ali, pro-Shia sect, not traditional Shiism. Again, but there were there are some regions where the dominant faith amongst the Kurds is Shiism, particularly in Iran, where Shiism was uh, promoted by the state. And then, of course, you have groups like the Yazidis, who today, obviously, whether the Yazidis are Kurds are uh, is a controversial uh, topic. You know, many Yazidi activists see themselves as a distinct group from the Kurds, but you know, in the early modern uh, period, Yazidis were 
often described as being Kurds. In fact, I've seen Ottoman documents where they say there's good Kurds, those are the Sunnis, and there's bad Kurds, those are the Yazidis, right? So there are sectarian differences, there are linguistic differences, there are tribal differences. Obviously, you have a variety of different tribal groups. You have different types of tribes. You have nomadic tribes uh, that live you know, in the mountains uh, and survive by uh, you know, shepherding the sheep and uh, other livestock like that. You have sedentary communities as well. My, the tribal group that I come from is a sedentary group uh, that, you know, that there was a tribal elite that ruled over um, peasants and who lived in villages and engaged in farming as well. And then, of course, you have urban groups as well. Uh, there were, you know, there were tradesmen, there were, you know, um, you know, a variety of different uh, uh, classes of people engaged in different activities. Of course, you know, often, you know, things, certain trades and certain things were dominated by, let's say, non-Kurdish groups, but there were Kurdish uh, artisans and tradesmen in different parts of Kurdistan. It depended on the town. Some towns like uh, Van, for example, which had large Armenian populations, the, the urban the urban working class or artisanal class was predominantly Armenian. But for example, in some towns like Suleimania, the artisans were predominantly Kurdish. So you have all these, you have socioeconomic differences, you have linguistic differences, you have tribal differences, you have sectarian uh, differences. There's no consolidated national identity. Uh, now in the modern era, of course, it's tempting to ascribe the Kurds' lack of a state to this inherently heterodox nature of Kurdish society. But I tend to see that as kind of irrelevant because you know all national groups are heterodox until there's a state that imposes unity on them. You know, uh, Eugene Weber's book, you know, Peasants into Frenchmen really outlines this process in Europe, right? So, you know, the, Kur the Kurdish community today still has enormous linguistic differences, so on and so forth. But I don't see those as being particularly illustrative in understanding the divisions that exist amongst Kurds today. Kurdish political parties, for example, let's say in Turkey, they draw support from Alevis and Sunnis. They draw support from Zazaki speakers and Kirmanji speakers, right? The same can be said within Iranian Kurdistan and Iraqi Kurdistan, where you know, linguistic differences aren't really going to tell you the political orientation of someone. So uh, in the, uh, the, the main divisions, I would say, in the modern era amongst Kurds are not based on these pre-existing uh, segmented identities, but rather uh, on the, uh, basically on a national basis. And what I mean on, by that is that in each of the nation states within which the Kurds reside, there has been a different relationship with the state. There's been a different political history. And those differences have given for, given, have created different versions of Kurdish nationalism, different traditions of Kurdish nationalism. And to a certain extent, this is even recognized by Kurds themselves in the way that they use language. What do I mean by this? So, you know, Westerners will talk about Turkish Kurds, Iranian Kurds, Iraqi Kurds, Syrian Kurds. But many Kurdish nationalism, nationalists themselves won't use that vocabulary, right? Instead, they will say Northern Kurds, Southern Kurds, Eastern Kurds, and Western Kurds. But even though they're using geographical terms, they're really using political terms because Western Kurds refers to Kurds in Syria, but there are parts of you know, Kurdistan that are further west, but are in Turkey but those Kurds are called Northern Kurds. So I would say the primary divisions amongst Kurds today are based on the nation state within which they live. There are, there are of course, interactions between these different fields, but political mobilization and activity primarily takes place on the national basis. And, and so Iraqi Kurdish political parties operate within Iraq. Iranian Kurdish political parties operate within Iran, Turkish Kurdish political parties operate in Turkey, and Syrian Kurdish political parties operate uh, in, in Syria. Even if they have ideological and political links, institutionally they function in a, in a different way. Uh, 
and their political orientation is different because their experience of state power has been different. The story of Kurdish nationalism in Turkey is different from the story in Iraq. So it's actually very illustrative of the dynamic I'm talking about. In Turkey, as I mentioned earlier, the Turkish state, especially from the 50s onwards, basically struck a kind of grand bargain with the feudal classes of Kurdistan. So many of the big tribal landowners joined Turkish political parties, became part of the political uh, Turkish political establishment. Many moved to the capital, Ankara. Many even assimilated into Turkish language and culture. What was the outcome of this? Well, Kurdish nationalism in Turkey took on a very left-wing political orientation. The earliest actions of the Kurdish Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK, the dominant political party amongst Kurds in Turkey, or at least until recently the dominant political party, um, their first military actions were not against the Turkish state, but against collaborators, against feudal, uh, feudal elites. In Iraq, the story is a little bit different. Up until 1958, you know, there was definitely a kind of increasing left-wing uh, Elan to the Kurdish movement. But with the rise of Ba'athism, the Ba'athist state basically alienated all sections of Kurdish society. So they alienated the feudal elites that had supported the monarchy because they were promising land reform, but they alienated the left-wing orientated urban intellectuals through Arab nationalism and Arabization. So you end up with a Kurdish nationalism in, in Iraq, which is more, let's say, pure nationalist, you know, which is more sort of a trans class alliance, which ultimately is dominated by, you know, dominated by the Barzanis who have a strong position coming out of the tribal wing of, the, uh, of Kurdish society. Whereas in Turkey, it's a little bit of a different story because you have a more left-wing orientated political movement. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. How much have the Barzanis um, dominated Kurdish politics and how far back does it go given their tribal history? Sure. So fun fact about the Barzanis is they're not actually a tribe. They are a tribe today. But when we think of tribe, you know, people often talk about, you know, tribes as these primordial entities, when in fact they're political entities that are created over time. So who were the Barzanis? Well, the Barzanis were sheikhs. So they were actually religious figures. You had uh, the dominant form of Islam in terms of practice was Sufi Islam. Sufi Islam is the mystical branch of Islam. You know, there's Sunni Sufis, there's Shia Sufis, but ultimately it's this spiritualistic version of Islam. And the Barzanis uh, were a, you know, were a, were religious figures. And they came to prominence in the late 19th century. And they came to prominence primarily as a reaction to the Zibari clan. So people might remember Iraq's foreign minister was a guy called Hoshia Zibari. The Zibaris were an important tribe that dominated uh, certain parts of northern I Iraq. Uh, and the, the tribal system that existed in that region was almost a caste-like system. It was extremely, uh, it was extremely um, hierarchical and uh, authoritarian. And the Barzanis were religious uh, leaders that sort of had a spiritual cachet and they became a focus of resistance to the uh, Zibaris. They had almost, in their origins, they had almost a kind of socialistic uh, bent to them. So, for example, people from different classes in society, if they wanted to get married, they could elope and get be married by the Barzani sheikhs. Uh, there was a communal, uh, there were communal sort of uh, land, uh, uh, communal sort of groups established in the mountains. There was almost a kind of millenarian movement. Uh, that took place under the leadership of, of, of the of the Barzanis, and gradually over time, and, and well, and I've seen this in Ottoman documents. If you look at the Ottoman documents from the sort of 1890s, they refer to the Barzanis as sheikhs, uh, 
and they refer uh, they refer to uh, they refer to the Bayazanis not as a tribe but as a community. They use the word Jamaat, which refers to a religious community. But over time, this religious co community coalesces into a kind of tribal-like uh, group. And by 1910, 1911, they're talking about, they're using the term Ashiret. So they become a kind of tribe-like group. And basically, in the 1910s, the Barzanis become involved with anti-Ottoman activism. They, they basically ally themselves with, you know, some Kurdish tribes are pro-government, and some begin to sort of align themselves with Abdul Razak Bedekhan, this sort of nationalist intellectual who tries to get Russian support uh, to for, for a Kurdish rebellion. And what does Abdul Razak Bedekhan uh, see as being the potential military force to out the Ottomans from Kurdistan? Well, he, he basically allies himself with anti-government tribes, and the Barzanis are one of those anti-government tribes. And so the Barzanis become involved in Kurdish nationalist politics in about the 1910s, but they really emerge to prominence in the 1930s and 40s during the Iraqi, uh, you know, during the Iraqi period. So they, there is a kind of prehistory that goes back to the 1910s, uh, but you know, the real, so the real deal is in the 40s and 50s where the Barzanis become involved with not only they they basically they have a rebellion against the Iraqi government and then they flee to Iran just as the Soviets are in Iran and they become involved in this sort of Soviet backed experiment in Kurdish autonomy the Mahabad Republic uh, Mullah Mustafa Barzani the leader of the Barzanis is appointed as the generalissimo of the Mahabad Republic and uh is kind of baptized as a kind of nationalist leader. And then, you know, event when the Republic is crushed in Iran uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 1940s, in the later 1940s, he flees to the Soviet Union. And then in 1958, he returns to Iraq and basically takes over leadership of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which was a political formation that had previously been dominated by urban intellectuals. But, you know, because he has, you know, support amongst the tribes, he basically outmaneuvers them and becomes the dominant political force in Iraq and sort of reinvents himself as this, you know, as a Kurdish nationalist leader. And the Barzanis have basically maintained that position. They've sort of transformed themselves from, from tribal leaders or like religious leaders to tribal leaders and now to uncrowned monarchs of Kurdistan. So this leads us to the modern period and the seeming obsession that the Kurds have played in the imaginations of the Western leftists. One as CIA agents because of their seeming roles in the wars in Iraq and Syria, and the other because of the PKK and PUM. Um, not boom, not excuse me. Um, that's Spanish of War. Um, PKK P and PUK, PUK, yeah. Um, becoming major leftist models. I mean, you think about all the um, glowing, almost <laughs> orientalist caricatures of utopias in northern Syria that you got out of anarchists. Um, and so the Kurds have taken this weird double meaning for the American left as like proof that this is viable in a non-Western context, but also probably secret CIA agents or something. Um, how did this happen? And I know you fight this battle a lot on Twitter. So. Yeah. So, well, you know, the first point is that because of the geopolitics of the Kurdish question, the fact that the Kurds are divided between different states, it is meant that the interests of different Kurdish groups have been aligned in different ways. So the, you know, another factor that explains the left-wing orientation of the Kurdish movement in Turkey 
and the right-wing orientation of the Kurdish movement in Iraq is the geopolitics. Iraq was leaning towards the Soviet Union, especially in the 1970s. So the Kurdish movement, you know, was received support from the Shah of Iran, received, received support from the Israelis, uh, because, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Uh, so, you know, the, the geopolitical orientation of Iraq sort of dictated that the Iraqi Kurds were going to be orientated towards the United States and its allies, particularly, you know, following the, the, the first Gulf War. In Turkey, the geopolitics is completely inverse because Turkey is a, a NATO country, right? So the Kurdish movement there, you know, very much was more, you know, uh, orientated towards anti-Americanism and those kind of ideologies. So when you think of, a, when, when most Westerners think of the Kurds, if they think of them at all, you know, I think it's hard for them to grapple with the fact that, you know, the primary division amongst the Kurds are between the different nation states within which the Kurds uh, uh, live and the different histories of those nation states have dictated very radical, diff radically different postures. So it kind of makes no sense because people often mix up the Iraqi Kurds and the uh, Turkish Kurds. I mean, I remember seeing Trump literally sitting next to the Iraqi Kurdish prime minister and then talking about the heroics of the Syrian Kurds, not realizing that there is a hell of a lot of bad blood between the Iraqi Kurdish political leadership and the Syrian Kurdish political leadership and the, and the, the, the Kurdish political leadership in Turkey. So Western leftists who, with a superficial understanding, they might look at the Iraqi Kurds and generalize that, oh, well, you know, this is the Iraqi Kurdish posture. That's the posture of all Kurds. And the same can be said for those who like focus on Turkey. This is the posture of the, 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 the Turkish Kurds. And that must be the posture for all Kurds. When in fact, you have like a very different, you know, posture based on the different history of the Kurds in different parts of Kurdistan. Syria is a little bit of a kind of difficult case mm -hmm. because it's in between them. It's in between them. And, you know, Syria was traditionally the most, and I use this term very tongue in cheek to a certain extent, the most backwards part of Kurdistan. You know, it was not a major center of Kurdish nationalism. Uh, and how much has. Does that have to do with the fact that the Alawites were themselves an ethnic minority and a religious minority? Well, you know, the issue in Syria, I mean, has been that the 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 Syrian nationalism has all has tried to paint the Kurds as being outsiders, and uh, has you know the Syrian regime's official line was that most of the Kurds in Syria had run away to Syria in the twenties. Uh, and we're not really Syrians or not really indigenous mm -hmm. to the region, which makes no sense because, you know, these borders didn't exist before 1918. There were groups on both sides uh, of the borders. And of course, there are very old Kurdish communities in places like Halepo and Damascus as well. The Damascus Kurdish quarter goes way back, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, so, uh, you know, under the French mandate, you know, the French sort of set up this confessional model in, 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 um, uh, in Syria, and the Kurds weren't ex weren't included in that model. Although there were rebellions in the 1930s, to tr uh, you know some some Kurdish groups tried to sort of uh, get you know get some kind of recognition in certain di uh, certain districts of Syria. But really, you know, the Kurds were kind of very 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 peripheral to uh, in, in Syria, and the Syrian government, particularly under Assad basically allowed the Kurdistan Workers' Party, which was a predominantly Turkish, uh, you know, based uh, organization, to organize in Syria because of their long-running conflict with Turkey. People uh, may know, but uh, during the Second World War, uh, the district of Hatay was basically taken away from Syria and given to Turkey. Uh, and this has been a big bone of contention. There's a lot of conflict over the water sources uh, coming into Syria from Turkey. So the Assad regime basically allowed uh, the PKK uh, 
which fled Turkey in the 19, uh, after the 1980 coup, allowed them to operate in, in Syrian-occupied Lebanon to set up a political organization and to recruit amongst Syrian Kurds to basically direct the Syrian Kurds' political activity towards Turkey. What was the cost of this? Well, you know, the, the PKK's official line was that they were in favor of a united, socialist, independent Kurdistan encompassing all parts of Kurdistan. But very quickly, they made an exception to this where they said, oh, well, you know, this doesn't include Syria, of course, because, you know, the Kurds in Syria, as the Syrian government says, are not really, you know, are mainly just refugees. So they kind of uh, basically, you know, made had this deal with the Syrian government where that they wouldn't propagate for Kurdish self-rule in Syria. Uh, and in turn, the Syrians would sort of allow them to operate, would support them. And this lasted until the Turks basically put the kibosh on this and said, look, if you don't get rid of the PKK, we're going to come in and we're going we're gonna to get rid of them for you. And the leader of the PKK, Abdullah Öcalan, then went on the run and was eventually uh, uh, captured by Turkish security forces and put on trial and, uh, and things like that. So the PKK basically had a Syrian branch which it operated uh, and functioned and was allowed as a kind of not it wasn't legal but like it was allowed was was basically used as a way to direct Syrian Kurds away from Syrian politics and towards Turkey now come the Syrian civil war the Assad regime has to preserve its resources. And one of the ways that they do this is withdrawing from the Kurdish uh, territories. They take, you know, all the apparatus of government, they, they take the desks, the computers, the tables away and just leave it to the Kurds to look after themselves. Who is the only force that's like has any semblance of organization? Well, it's the, it's the, you know, the Syrian branch of the PKK, right? And this group basically comes into power in this power vacuum and begins implementing the models of government that they'd been developing, this kind of anarchistic hybrid uh, ideology, which kind of started emerging in the 1990s. I should note for your viewers, you know, when the PKK was founded, it was very much the traditional Stalinesque style uh, socialist party. But, you know, in the 90s and more pronounced in the 2000s, they began adopting more anarchistic models of social, uh, you know, of political ideology. There was a very strong emphasis on female emancipation, uh, you know, self-rule, um, you know, municipal governments. You know, uh, you know, Murray Bookchin is the guy that, you know, people cite as being the influence. But of course, if you go to Syria, most people don't know who the hell Murray Bookchin is. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's through... Abdul Öcalan, the leader of the, the PKK. So the Syrian Kurds basically have power handed to them. And, you know, they they use that power to consolidate their control over first the, you know, they console, consolidate their control over the predominantly Kurdish areas of northern Syria, which I would note are not contiguous, right? There are like, diff, they're, they're interspersed by Arabs, there was a deliberate policy of the Syrian government to break up Kurdish settlement in Syria with a project known as the Arab Belt. So there were Arabs settled in between uh, uh, areas of uh, Kurdish, you know, predominance. And so initially, you know, these group, uh, the Syrian Kurds take over and they basically start operating as the government in these regions and, you know, become a third faction in the Syrian civil war. So I guess one thing I have to ask is you have spelled out the practical politics for why Syria was a different case. Um, one thing I might ask you though, is what is the difference between the ideological justifications of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party versus the Syrian Ba'ath Party, considering they were somewhat allied and both are kind of late developments of 
pan-Arabism that were kind of Soviet friendly, but also did the whole, you know, bait and switch the West versus the East thing that they learned from Nasser. Mm -hmm. um, well, in Syria, um, as I mentioned, the sort of Syrian government official line was that the Kurds in Syria are primary refugees. They're not indigenous groups. In Iraq, it was a bit different, obviously, because from the foundation of the Iraqi state under British colonial rule, there was some kind of recognition of the Kurds as a distinct ethnic group. And, you know, I would make the argument, one of the reasons that um, the violence against Kurds in Iraq was so intense, especially during the 1980s, was because they was they were recognized as a national group. And so, you know, the Ba'ath Party was like, well, you know, they're a separate group. If we're going to maintain this as an Arab country, we're going to have to liquidate this group, right? Whereas in a place like Turkey, the project was more assimilation, like they're, they're not, there's no Kurds. So obviously, you know, how can we do a genocide against a group that we don't really believe exists? We'll just you know, we'll do piecemeal violence against Kurds and force assimilation. So in Iraq, uh, you know, the Ba'ath Party actually signed uh, an agreement with the Kurdish movement in the 1970s for Kurdish autonomy. The institutions of Kurdish autonomy were not created ex nihilo in 1991. The institutions of Kurdish autonomy were actually created in the 1970s, right? But it was a kind of very empty version of autonomy. It was... Uh, it was an authoritarian top-down autonomy. And then in the 1980s, it was an autonomy which was at the same time, uh, you know, that ex at the same time existed as, you know, violent policies directed at, you know, exterminating large numbers of the Kurdish rural population as well. So almost like a, a reservation style uh, po uh, yeah. autonomy. The, so, the kind of thing you see with most national projects post 1930s. So, so, the, so in Iraq, there's always been this kind of weird contradiction that Iraq is an Arab country, but from the very inception, there has been a kind of recognition that there is a group called Kurds and, you know, those Kurds, you know, how do we deal with that, right? Mm. Whereas in Syria, the Ba'ath Party sort of didn't concede that the Kurds were an indigenous group uh, in Iraq, uh, in, in Syria. So there's a kind of, there's a difference in that sense. And of course, the the, the Kurdish population in, in in Iraq lives in a fairly contiguous zone, and there are several important urban centers, whereas you don't really have that to the same degree uh, in Syria. I guess that does lead me to two kind of questions that have kind of come up already. One is being asked is, why what did the PKK turn to anarchism in the in the arts? I will I will answer that they didn't. Um, mm -hmm. That the pickup of of municipalism I was covered earlier, and that rhymes with anarchism, but isn't really the same thing. Um, I will also, I guess I would want to think a little bit about though. The other complication with Syria is that the Ba'ath Party, even though it is Arab, is aligned to a religious and, frankly, ethnic minority, um, even within Syria, in a way that has never been true um, in Iraq. Well, it was kind of it was sort of true in Iraq as well, because. Uh, you well, know, yeah, I guess the Sunnis were the, a minority. The, the, the Sunnis are a minority. And in fact, one of the biggest pills to swallow for Sunni Iraqis was that, you know, they'd been told they weren't the minority for so long that they refused to believe that, you know, some refused to believe that Shias were the majority. Although, you know, the sectarianism is never as clear cut as people might like to believe it. There were always Shias in the Ba'ath Party. In fact, the Ba'ath Party arrived in Iraq through Shias uh, in many ways. Um, you know, the 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 thing about Ba'athism is is that you know if you Ba'athism was a good vehicle for minorities to assert their rule without having direct sectarian rule, because after all, if we're all Arabs, what does it matter if everybody in the government is a member of one sect? We're all Arabs, you know. It's 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 not a problem. And in 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 the case of Iraq. Uh, I don't know if this is actually 100% true, but I, I believe it is. 
they one of the re, one of the things they did in Iraq was they abolished surnames, and uh, basically your surname became your father's name, which is extremely bloody confusing, right? Yeah, they do that in North Africa, and that's traditional. But, but... one one of the arguments that they did this was because like. Um, if they hadn't, the entire Iraqi government would have been Al Tarkriti, and that would have been super embarrassing for the uh, for the Iraqi government. But um, yeah, you had um, you so so you had uh, you, you know you had this kind of sectarianism, but it was not it, it, you know even you know even in Syria you know there are there are um, you know there are Alawites who are not on the side of the government uh, as well. Right. In, in in Iraq, one of the first things that Saddam Hussein did was like consolidate his power amongst the Sunnis, which meant, you know, bopping a lot of Sunnis on the head as well. So, you know, the, the uh, you know, sectarianism could be used at times as a vehicle to, to sort of close ranks in the regime. At times, there was not a strong emphasis. It depended on the circumstances of the uh, governing powers uh, in the particular country. But that seems an interesting difference from, say, what happened in Turkey, where it was explicitly secular, but sectarianism was literally how you defined who was a Turk. Well, um, exactly. I mean, I mean, what the one of the arguments for secular? I mean, first of all, you know, people mistake secularism for atheism. The Turkish right. state was always, you know, very clear that it wasn't an atheist state. You know, one of the arguments against explicit use of Islam in the public sphere was that. If you're going to use Islam in the public sphere, you're implying that there are some people who are not Muslims, right? And that is that is divisive. So you know, Turkey has this very interesting history of secularism, and you know, the defining feature of Turkishness became Islam, not language, but Islam. So you know, you had Turkish-speaking uh, Christians who were deported as Greeks, as Greeks even though they could probably make the argument that they were more pure Turkish than uh, many of the Turkish-speaking groups that were Muslims or uh, that, had that had moved into Turkey during the 19th century from places like Russia, the Balkans, and, and things like that. You know, people, you know, Turkishness is, there's always been a tension between a kind of, uh, and I hate using the word civ civic and ethnic, but a kind of civic Turkish nationalism which had opened the door for assimilation because there were large numbers of immigrants coming into the country from the Balkans and Russia and a sort of more blood and soil ethnic Turkish nationalism. Uh, and so Ataturk tried to kind of like bridge the divide between that. And Islam obviously was a very useful vehicle for that. So, uh, you know, you had, uh, uh, you had, um, you know, the, the famous, the famous, uh, statement of Turkish nationalism is, is ne mutlu Türküm diyene. Happy is he who calls himself a Turk. So there was always a path to assimilation through the adoption of Turkish language and culture in, in, in Turkey. And, you know, the Kemalist Turkish nationalists are often, they complain. It's like, why are you Kurds complaining? You can be a first-class citizen. All you have to do is give up your language, culture, and call yourself a Turk, which obviously right. you know, some people don't want to do. Although, I mean... It's interesting if you study like Jewish populations in the Middle East because Turkey and Iran are the places where there still are large um, Jewish populations as opposed to like the historical um, until the 1920s and 30s high points of Jewish population in the Middle East, which would have been like Egypt. Or Baghdad. Which I think, yeah, Baghdad, which would take... Uh, depending on the year, the largest Jewish populations outside of Poland before the Shoah would have been either in Baghdad or Cairo. Istanbul, um, major center of Jewish uh, culture and life, you know, you know, yeah. So, so, Tur you know, Turkey has this like complex paradox of national identity and trying to, trying to, you know, national identities are always kaleidoscopic. They're always in flux and in change, depending on the different material circumstances that the state finds itself in. You know, nations aren't given. It's nationalisms and states that create nations, as 
Eric Hobsbawm said. And I would add to that, sometimes their policies accidentally create the wrong nation. You know, so if they go to, you know, if they, you know, suppress a group too hard, if that group didn't have a group identity beforehand, they help forge that group identity. Oh, yeah. One of the paradoxes of Kurdish nationalism in Turkey or the Kurdish movement, I would say, in Turkey, and we can perhaps get into the question of nation state and the national movement in a little bit. But one of the paradoxes is that, you know, to all intents and purposes, the Kurdish language has, has been eliminated in Turkey, not eliminated, but you know, most Kurds in Turkey are more comfortable speaking Turkish. The Kurdish movement in Turkey speaks uh, Turkish. Um, you know, if you want to engage in Kurdish politics, yes, you know, there are the, there are the, the Kurdish speakers, but Turkish is the language in which Kurdish nationalism is sort of taking place in. So, well, but, you know, so linguistic assimilation has been highly successful, but at the same time as this linguistic uh, uh assimilation is reaching its peak, so too is Kurdish national consciousness. So, you know, the, the, the Turks succeeded in destroying the Kurdish language in Turkey to a great degree. Yet, despite this, Kurds today are probably far more aware of, an, of a shared national identity than, for example, they were in the early 1920s where, like, Turkish had made very few inroads into Kurdish society. Right. I mean, it's no, again, the parallel to the, the, the idea of Jewish nationhood as a viable nationhood really emerges out, out of um, Christian persecution turning into racialized persecution after the Spanish um, Inquisition, in particular against both uh, Moors and uh, converso Jews and Muslims. Well, one of um, my co one of my mm -hmm. colleagues, for example, I, I I remember she gave a she works on Jewish conversion in France and Britain uh, in the medieval period, and I remember her talk was really fantastic. It was about um, uh, it was about how Jewish communities were approached, and we had this situation where initially. They were like, okay, we're going to force these Jews to become Christians. We're going to we're going to clamp down on them and make them Christians, and that was phase one. And then phase two was like, oh damn, now we don't know who the Jews are. We've converted them all. So who the hell are the where? Who's the Jews? So right, who has these special privileges and accumulations that they had as a middle class before? Exactly. So we have these. We have this. It's like they 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 succeed. They succeed in converting them, and then they're like, "Damn! Now we can't keep a track on them." Yeah. So so, uh, and you know, so we have, um, you know, so we have Kurdish national consciousness today is very strong in Turkey, despite the destruction of sort of key aspects of what we would think of as central to Kurdish national identity. That is language. What I would say, though, what the kind of addendum I would put on this is that in political terms, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Kurdish movement is unified behind the, the idea of creating a Kurdish nation state. Mm. I think, uh, I mean, and I have my certain idiosyncrasies when I look at this uh, question. I like to talk about not nationalism, but the politics of nationality. And the politics of nationality has a variety of different postures it can take towards the resolution of the national question. The nation state is one of those postures at one end, and the other is complete assimilation, right? And then in between those two poles, between assimilate, complete assimilation and the creation of a sep uh, separate nation state, you have a variety of, you know, different postures that could be autonomy. National, national cultural autonomy, autonomy within a singular polity. polity. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so uh, because, you know, the problem when we discuss nationalism is that, you know, we get this teleological narrative where you have like this nationalism that grows and then suddenly there's a nation state, which is the obvious, you know, outcome of it. But usually the creation of a nation state is highly contingent. And it's only after the creation of na the nation state that this teleological narrative can be created. Usually the nationalists, even, you know, just before the creation of a nation state, were cranks and outsiders, did not represent the majority opinion within a particular community. It was only with the creation of a nation state that they become the self-evident inheritors of, you know, historical destiny. 
So the Kurds don't have a nation state. So when we look at the Kurdish uh, uh, movement, we see at various times, the Kurdish movement has orientated it to itself toward the creation of a nation state. The Iraqi Kurdish movement in particular follows that nation state model. The K Kurdish movement in Turkey at times advocated, uh, you know, swung towards the sort of separatist nationalism, the nationalist version. The early 1930s was one such period. The early 1980s was one such period. But this is not a teleology. In the 1960s and 70s, the reemergence of the Kurdish movement was not contiguous with the rise of separatist nationalism, but rather the Kurdish movement in the 60s and 70s was di divided between those who advocated Kurdish, uh, you know, Kurdish emancipation through constitutional activity, through working through the institutions of bourgeois democracy, and those who advocated uh, the emancipation of Kurds via socialist revolution. It was only with the destruction of both the constitutionalist wing and the socialist revolutionary wing that the PKK emerged, taking a maximalist position both on socialist revolution and separatist nationalism. And I would argue, and this is controversial, people disagree with me on this, I would argue the PKK's shift away from separatist nationalism, even a socialistic version of separatist nationalism, towards first autonomy and federalism and now to municipalism and things like that, an ideology that not only affects the PKK, but has also influenced the HDP, which is the constitutionalist wing of the Kurdish movement in Turkey. Uh, I would argue that was a response to the failure to secure military victory over the Turkish state. You're banging your head against the wall because you're not going to get a nation state. I think where the Kurdish movement was successful in Turkey was not at even getting into the big parliament until recently, not even getting into the Grand National Assembly, but taking control of municipal governments across uh, Kurdish dominated regions in Turkey. So. I think that political success helped feed a shift towards a different paradigm, which ultimately has come to sort of reject the nation state as a solution for the Kurdish question. And, you know, I have plenty of criticisms of the PKK, of the YPG, of, you know, you know a whole bunch of stuff. But I think, I think the realization that a nation state will not solve the Kurdish question is an important realization to come to. Because in Iraq, to all intents and purposes, uh, you know, in, 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 in many ways that matter to your average person, Kurds have their own state. There's a flag, Kurdish TV, you know, everything has got Kurdistan on it. You go to Iraqi Kurdistan, it's everything, you know, obviously there's some high level sovereignty issues over currency, over economic policy, which, you know, matter. But in, in symbolic terms, Kurds, have their own state in Iraq. But what many Iraqi Kurds have discovered is that, well, okay, it's better than being under foreign rule, but it's not that much better. We still have a corrupt sort of political oligarchy based on patronage and control. Uh, people still get hauled away to the police station and beaten up. It's just now they get beaten up with Kurdish speaking police officers as opposed to Arabic speaking police officers. So many of the structural problems that you know, bedeviled, uh, uh, you know, so I don't want to political the gains of sort of national self-rule in Iraqi Kurdistan, but I don't want to over-exaggerate them as well. Uh, so, you know, many young Kurds in Iraqi Kurdistan are extremely alienated with the nation state model of nationalism and are looking for alternatives. Some are finding that in the PKK, the YPG, uh, which, who are advocating different models, socialistic models, which, you know, look attractive to many young people. And the other uh, thing, can you guess what it is? Islamism. Uh, people don't like to talk about it, but, uh, you know, um, Salafi version of Islam, Takfiri Islam is growing amongst certain elements of Iraqi Kurdish society. ISIS recruited amongst Kurds, uh, quite successful in some places as well. So the kind of right-wing nation state model uh, has lot has lost a lot of its prestige, and people are looking for alternative models. And the PKK offers the PKK YPG constellation of post-nationalist, socialistic, anarchistic 
uh, ideology offers one path and the, um, uh, the Islamists offer another path. And to add to that, I would say Turkey is, uh, within Turkey, you have another complicating factor, which, which is the rise of the HDP. The HDP uh, is a parliamentary movement. It is, you know, people often say it's the political wing of the PKK, but it, you know, obviously there are PKK supporters that support the HDP, but simply because of the nature of the Turkish state, you know, the relationship between the PKK and the HDP is not as close as, for example, Sinn Féin and the IRA. The Turkish state, uh, you know, would not, you know, that it's just not something would happen. It's quite, a, it's a distinct movement. That movement uh, has followed an interesting path, which is to try and integrate the Kurdish sector uh, of the uh, constitutional uh, uh, politics in Turkey as a, as a kind of core to a, a left-wing anti-systematic coalition, which includes not only Kurds, but also socialists, uh, uh, you know, um, environmentalists, and other others who are anti-capitalist forces. So the HDP, I think, is an interesting political formation because it's often called Kurdish nationalists, when it really isn't, when it actually is advocating a kind of like Corbyn, Corbynista politics in in Turkey, which we, you know, we don't think of it in that way, but I would say, you know, the HDP has gone a different route, which is to say, okay, you know, we'll get, we'll get Kurdish rights, but as part of a general anti-capitalist push through parliamentary politics. And sort of that politics is kind of falling to bits now because the Turkish state is repressing it. But, you know, there were a lot of people, especially around 20, 2015, who were looking at this as a kind of potential uh, model that the, the Kurds were going to move out of their ghetto and going to become part of a broad anti-establishment, anti-capitalist coalition within the parliamentary system in Turkey, which, you know, ultimately was crushed. So this is a good place to end our discussion here, but we're going to have a Patreon discussion talking about the left and the West, nationalism, the various answers to the national question, and what hasn't been learned from the last 20 years. But I think to have that conversation, we needed to have this one because I and studying the Curtis question for the last, you know, 10 years myself, realized that the discourse on it in most uh, even informed Western left uh, outlets was impoverished at best and silly most of the time, as yeah, it I'm, often is on the Middle East, frankly, on any question. I remember, I mean, I remember uh, we had Vijay Prashad on uh, This Is Revolution. And I'm not criticizing Vijay Prashad here. Uh, Vijay, and I would say Vijay Prashad pu is publishing house, Leftwood Books published a very good book uh, uh, written by Frederica Gierdink about uh, the PKK. She was a journalist who, who you know, spent time with the PKK embedded for you a year. Yeah, that's noted. But uh, Prashad, when, when he was asked about Rojava, he began talking about Rojava in a very confused way and then started talking about the Iraqi Kurds which you know is a telltale sign because if you know anything about the Kurdish movement, the Iraqi Kurds are like, if you want to hear people talk shit about the PKK, don't go to Turkey. Go to talk to supporters of the Barzanis. They despise the PKK. They can't, you know, they can't go too hard on them in public sometimes because you know they don't want to alienate nationalist opinion. There's there's a kind of like baseline, you know. Kurdish nationalism in Iraq, which is like, yeah, all Kurds are awesome. We love all the Kurds, you know, team, go team Kurds. So, you, you know, uh, you don't want to be like too much, you don't want to be too much going in that direction. But yeah, they despise the PKK. They despise their political project. They don't think that they're good Kurds. They're like PKK. They say they're radicals, but they don't even speak Kurdish. You know, we speak Kurdish. We're better Kurds than they are. So there is, you know, uh, so when someone starts talking about Rojava, Turkey, the PKK, and Iraq and starts mixing up, you know they're like kind of confused on the really serious political, uh, you know, differences between the Kurds and the fact, and I'll say this, you know, quite clearly, is like, just like Arab nationalism, right? 
there is a pan-Arab nationalism which does have an effect on politics, right? But the primary driving force in the Arab world is not pan-Arabism, it's nation states. And you can, you can, you know, there's Egyptian nationalism, there's Syrian nationalism, there's Iraqi nationalism, and these are significant forces. And I would make the same observation about the, Kurd the Kurds. Because of the 20th century, because nations are modern, there is a pan-Kurdish nationalism. There is a, the, especially amongst the diaspora and the intellectual classes, you know, there's a, there's a go, go team Kurd. But there is also very powerful territorial nation state nationalism. There is an Iraqi Kurdish nationalism, a, a Iranian Kurdish nationalism, a Turkish Kurdish nationalism, and a Syrian Kurdish nationalism, which are distinct from each other, not only in an organizational sense, but to a certain degree in an ideological sense, in a certain degree to the, the historical narratives that they emphasize are different. So we have we have these, we have a kind of dialectic between the pan-Kurdish dream and the sort of limited regional Kurdish nationalisms as well. So just as we see in the case of all, you know, pan-nationalist ideologies, there's always a, this kind of dialectic, whether it was pan-Slavism, the dialectic between, you know, pan-Slavism and then Polish, Russian and Yugoslav nationalism and so on and so forth. So yeah, the Kurds operate in that kind of way and we need to understand those important differences. All right, well, thank you for that, Gene. We'll see you in about 10 minutes, 15 per minutes. Perfect. And uh, I'm gonna do some patron business and then we're gonna run your outro because people need to know that the intro and outro here, music was provided by Jason Miles and Bitter Lake which is kind of a redundant statement because they're the same person. Um, but the images were made by you. Yep. So I um, hope the I hope chat liked my the new Vine blog intro. I feel it needed to be a lot more black pill than it was. So I tried to make it as black pill as possible. Yep. Um, so we're going to sh show the outro as soon as I announce some things. For which is, the which is more optimistic, which at yes. your request was more optimistic. Yeah. I didn't want a double doomer, um, scenario. All right. So let's handle that real fast. Okay, so I'd like to thank the new Khan E. Kahanans. Um, these are $10 or more patrons who have the right to request the show once a year. Um, we have five new ones in the last month. I'd like to thank Carl Shepard, the Rapparte, Mitch Galman. Zandi or Andy or, or Andy. It's hard to know because the first letter is the symbol used um, in text speak for the Arabic Ain, which I can't actually pronounce because my Arabic sucks. And I don't know if the person actually means it to be that. So we're just going to go with Andy. Uh, but if it's Andy, you can forgive me, or Thrindy, or whatever. Um, and then Stephen A. Simons. These are all the new Khan Iha Kahanans. Um, thank you for your support. And make sure you get in contact with me sometime this year for your episode request if you have one. Okay, with that, we are over and out. Meet us over at the Patreons. We can talk about the national question um, and leftism in the West um, for those in the know with reference to the Middle East and Kurdistan, but much broader conversation. Thank you and see you in about 10 minutes. Enjoy our new outro.